Good afternoon. I welcome you all for this week 7's discussion on fluid dynamics and turbo machines. So far in this week 7, we have studied pumps, we have talked about different types of hydraulic turbines and in the last lecture, we have talked about cavitation in hydro turbo machines that is cavitation in pumps and turbines. Today what we will do is, we will take up some example problems that you can come across in these topics. We will do step by step and we will give you also the tutorials which you can solve to get a feel for different aspects of the theory covered in this week. So, let us look at the first problem. The first problem states that we have a pump impeller whose inner radius is 50 mm, the outer radius is 200 mm and it rotates at 900 rpm. Please note we have not said which one is the inlet, which one is the exit. We have simply said inner radius and outer radius, but you should not get confused because you know in case of a pump the flow takes place from the inner radius to the outer radius and hence the inner radius in case of a pump corresponds to the pump inlet and the outer radius corresponds to the pump outlet. The inlet and outlet blade angles measured from the tangential direction are 20 degree and 10 degree respectively. The blade height is uniform and is 50 millimeter. Assume there is no pre wheel or inlet wheel as we call it and neglect slip. The hydraulic efficiency of the pump is given as 80 percent. We need to calculate the volume flow rate, stagnation pressure rise across the pump and input power to the pump. As I have told you while discussing the theory, the most important part in solving these problems is drawing a velocity triangle. The velocity triangle the vectors need not be absolutely to the scale, but it should give you a feel for the numbers. So, let us look at the situations we have. We have the inlet valve to be 0, hence C 1 equal to C 1 m and C 1 u is 0, beta 1 is 20 degrees and beta 2 is 10 degrees, though it does not look really so nicely here, but this as I told you is a representative and we have a C 2 u value. And beta 1 and beta 2 values are given, we are neglecting slip that means we will talk about W B L infinity as equal to W B L. We have given the n as r p m as 900. So, we have talked about u 1 as 4.71 meters per second and we get C 1 m from the inlet velocity triangle C 1 m by u 1 is nothing but tan beta 1 and we get C 1 m to be 1.72 meters per second. We continue with the velocity triangles and the discussions. So, we can find out V dot which is pi d 1 b 1 multiplied by C 1 m. Please note that in this problem, we do not have any information about the area blockage and hence we can neglect it. So, we can write that V dot equal to pi d 1 b 1 C 1 m. If you remember, we had an expression with a phi to talk about the blockage factor, but in this case blockage is not informed. So, we will take phi equal to 1 and we get V dot equal to 0 0.027 meter cube per second. This is the first part of the problem. We continue with it and since pi d 1 b 1 c 1 m equal to pi d 2 b 2 c 2 m. Why do we get it? It is because of continuity. Since pump is handling water and we are talking about an incompressible flow. So, the volume flow rate through the uh, inlet and the outlet of the impellers are same and hence we can equate the volume flow rate of the inlet which is pi d 1 b 1 c 1 m with the volume flow rate of the outlet which is pi d 2 b 2 c 2 m. And hence we can write that b 1 equal to b 2 which is given or c 2 m can be obtained because we know the c 1 m and d 1 and d 2. So, we find that c 2 m is 0.43 meters per second and we also know u 2 is 18.85 meters per second. So, C 2 u is equal to 
this portion C 2 u is equal to u 2 minus uh, C 2 m cot beta 2 which is 16.41 meters per second. And we get that W B L infinity is u 2 C 2 u minus u 1 C u 1, but C u 1 has been given to be 0. So, we get that W B L infinity is u 2 C 2 u, we know u 2, we know C 2 u. So, we can find out W B L infinity as uh, the 3 naught 9.35 meter square per second square. And since sleep is neglected or sleep is 1, so W B L is equal to W B L infinity and hydraulic efficiency expression in case of pump, please remember that in case of pump the energy is added by the blade on the fluid. So, the fluid effective energy specific energy uh, work as we find out find the difference of the useful energies of the fluid across the pump is W. So, eta hydraulic should be W by W B L and hence W is equal to W B L multiplied by eta hydraulic and we get an, a value for W as 247.48 meter square per second square. The question for the second part if you remember I will show you once again the second part question that we are asked is stagnation pressure rise across the pump. When we are trying to find out the stagnation pressure rise across the pump, we need to find out the specific work. Why is it so? Let us look into the expression for the specific work. The specific work or the head developed by the pump, if you multiply this head developed by the pump by multiplied by G, you get specific work. So, whether we express in terms of specific work or head developed by the pump, we can write that it is equal to P 2 minus P 1, let us say the head developed by the pump we are talking about. So, P 2 minus P 1 by rho g plus C 2 square minus C 1 square by 2 g plus Z 2 minus Z 1. Since no information is given about the elevation, we will neglect the elevation change for the time being. So, what are we landing up? We say that H is nothing but equal to P 2 by rho g plus C 2 square by 2 g minus P 1 by rho g minus C 1 square by 2 g. So, if you rearrange these terms, what you get is nothing but the stagnation pressure change. You take these terms P 2 with C 2 and P 1, let us put 2 ticks with C 1 square by 2 g. Then what happens? If you take these two terms together, what you get is the total pressure rise across the impeller. So, we can say the delta P 0 is equal to we can take the rho g to the other side multiplied by h or rho w and we can find out the total pressure rise or the stagnation pressure rise in the impeller. Assuming no other losses because no information is given like this friction loss, return flow loss etcetera we can say that the coupling power is nothing but the power which is in the blade and we it is nothing but rho v dot which is the mass flow rate multiplied by the blade specific power. And we get that coupling power is 8.35 kilowatt. So, what we have done in this problem is we have tried to find out with the help of the values given using the velocity triangles and using the concept of hydraulic efficiency. The slip can also be accommodated, if the slip was given then we know that W B L will be related with W B L infinity by the slip term. In this problem of course, you can think that slip value, slip factor has been given as 1. The second problem that we will talk about is about cavitation in a pump. Cavitation starts in a pump developing a head of 36 meters at a flow rate of 0 0.05 meter cube per second, when the total I explain it here as a sum of pressure and velocity heads is reduced to 3.5 meters. That is we have a pump which produces 36 meters of head at a flow rate of 0 0.05 meter cube per second, when the total head at the pump inlet is reduced to 3.5 meters. It is given that the atmospheric pressure is 750 millimeters of mercury 
and the vapor pressure is 1800 Pascals. Now, what is given is we have the same pump which will now operate at a different place where atmospheric pressure is 620 millimeter of mercury and the vapor pressure is 830 Pascals. This is very interesting. See, I, I, when we have talked about cavitation in pumps, I told you that as a user you know where the pump will be used, where at what will be the atmospheric pressure, what will be the vapor pressure. So, here we have a problem where a pump which was earlier used with an atmospheric pressure of 750 millimeter of mercury and vapor pressure of 1800 Pascals is now used in a location where atmospheric pressure is 620 millimeter of mercury and the vapor pressure is 830 Pascals. So, if this pump is developing the same head and flow rate, we have to find out what is the NPSH available under the changed conditions and then should we need to reduce the height of the pump from the sump and by how much. Of course, the specific gravity of mercury we all know, but is given here as 13.56. So, when we solve this problem, we have to keep one thing in mind that is if the pump is used, if a given pump is used, its NPSH R or NPSH required is fixed by the manufacturer. It does not depend on which location, what piping etcetera a user uses. So, from the first part of the problem, from the first paragraph of the problem, what we will try to find out is the NPSH required condition. How can we do that? We say that the cavitation starts. So, that means that is a critical condition. So, at that critical condition, whatever is the NPSH available is the NPSH required, because we know at critical condition NPSH A equal to NPSH R. So, let us try first find out how to find get the an, a value for NPSH A. So, we know that it is given that at the pump inlet on the in the pipe inside the pipe at the pump inlet the total pressure is 3.5 meters of head. So, we note, note that P 1 by rho g plus C 1 square by 2 g is 3.5 meters and we can write that NPSH available we have already derived it in the class on uh, cavitation in hydroturbo machines that P 1 by rho g plus C 1 square by 2 g minus P V by rho g is 3.5 3 to meters. This calculation you can do it and satisfy that we are getting the right values. So, this is a critical condition because cavitation just starts. Please note this term just starts, cavitation starts. So, this is very important. So, this start is related with this 3.5 meters that we are talking about and hence the value that we obtain here 3.32 meters also corresponds to the critical condition and we can say since it is critical condition NPSH required is equal to NPSH available is equal to 3.32 meters and this will not change even if you take the pump to some other place, this will remain constant. So, what we now need to find out is under the changed condition what happens to NPSH available, is it more than the required or less than the required. So, now applying Bernoulli's equation between the sump and the pump inlet for the first case that is on the first paragraph of the problem. So, applying Bernoulli's equation between the sump and the pump inlet for the first case we get that P 0 by rho g is equal to P 1 by rho g plus C 1 square by 2 g plus h s plus h s loss or we get that h s plus h s loss is 6.67 meters. Now, let us look at the second problem very carefully. The problem states that the pump in the new condition, new ambient condition delivers the same head at the same flow rate. Now, when you have the same flow rate, what happens to H s loss? H s loss we know is going to be proportional to V dot square. If V dot remains constant, then H s loss will also remain constant. So, we can say that if it is developing the same head and the same flow rate at the new location, we can say that the suction pipe loss is going to remain unchanged, which means H s loss is going to remain unchanged. So, let us first say that we keep the same old height of the pump above the sum, that is whatever the height we had in the first case, 
h s, we retain the same height h s above the sum. And let us try to find out whether n p s h available is more or less than the n p s h required in this case. If we find that n p s h available is less than the n p s h required in this case, then we have to think about lowering the pump. Otherwise, we can be happy with what we have got. So, let us find out this. So, then we can write that p 1 by rho g plus c 1 square by 2 g is equal to p 0 by rho g minus h s plus h s loss. So, you see basically we are using the same expression only difference comes is that p 0 by rho g has now changed. p 0 by rho g has changed because the atmospheric condition values are given to be different and we get a value of p 1 by rho g plus c 1 square by 2 g as 1.74 meter. So, this when we put it with the n p s h available, we find that this becomes 1.66 meters. Please recollect that n p s h required we have obtained from the earlier part of the problem is more than the n p s h available now. And you also know when n p s h available falls below the n p s h required, you have cavitation. So, hence we cannot run the pump at the same elevation, we need to reduce the pump height above the sump level. So, the answer will be yes, we need to reduce the pump height above the sump level, because n p s h available in the new setup is only 1.66 meters. And then we can find out that we have to find out that the pump should be lowered by n p s h required which we have obtained in the first part of the problem minus n p s h available in the second part of the problem which is equal to 1.66 meters. So, the final answer is that the pump in the second case has to be lowered by a height of 1.66 meters in order to just avoid cavitation or in order to pump to for to the pump to just get into cavitation. So, I hope you get an idea about how to use n p s h with the pump data given and use it to determine whether pump will cavitate or not. More along these problems will be given in the tutorial. So, we now talk about the third problem in this tutorial on the hydro turbo machines and this is on a Pelton turbine. The gross head for a Pelton turbine is 600 meters and the approach losses in the pen stock is 48 meters. As we have discussed in the theory, the net head that is available to the turbine is nothing but the gross head minus the approach losses and hence in this case we can say that the net head for a Pelton turbine is going to be 552 meters. Okay? The second part of the problem says that the buckets deflect the jet through an angle of 170 degree, while the relative velocity is reduced by 15 percent due to friction. We need to calculate the efficiency of the turbine assuming the bucket jet speed of 0.47. It is also given that the diameter of the wheel is 900 millimeter and there are two jets in this turbine. The nozzle velocity coefficient given for this problem is 0.98. We also need to find out the speed of rotation of the wheel and the diameter of the nozzles if the power output from the turbine is 1250 kilowatt. We look into now the second part of the problem which talks about the deflection of the jet due to the bucket in the next slide. The direction of the flow and had there been no bucket the flow would have continued. In the presence of the bucket there is a deflection of angle delta. This angle delta in the present problem is 170 degrees and hence beta 1 which is the direction of the velocity relative velocity that the makes with the tangential direction in the uh, outlet of the turbine is equal to 180 degree minus the angle of deflection and we have to consider the splitter blade. In this case the splitter blade is not mentioned, splitter angle is not mentioned and we talk about the beta is to be 0 and we get that this triangle degenerates into a straight line and we get that u 
W 2 and C 2 all are along one line. Why? Because this beta A is the splitter angle has become 0. That is our assumption and we take that beta 2 equal to 180 degree. So, beta 1 is by, uh, by, by the problem given is 180 degree minus 170 degree or 10 degrees and beta 2 is 180 degree. So, we can find out the jet velocity using the nozzle velocity coefficient which is equal to the 101.99 meters per second. You remember that we have talked about that this nozzle velocity coefficient k n deals with how much of the energy that is available in the potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. So, this value is 0.98 as it is very close to 1 as it ideally should be that we have discussed in the theory and we use the head as 552 meters as we have obtained as the net head. So, we get that C 2 is nothing but C j is 101.99 meters per second. We also know that u by C j is 0.47 this is given in the problem and hence we can find out u to be 42.84 meters per second. Let us look at this relationship. This entire line which is red is C 2, this blue portion is u. So, what is remaining is W 2 and hence W 2 is nothing but C 2 or C j minus u which is 59.15 meters per second. So, W 1 is equal to 0.85 times W 2 because we have said that because of friction there is 15 percent reduction in the relative velocity which is given as 50.28 meters per second. And then we can write W B L which we have already derived in the theory class that is equal to u times W 2 minus uh, cos beta 2 plus k cos beta 1 which will give me u times C 2 minus u times 1 plus k cos beta 1 remind you that k is 0.85 and we get the W B L is 4655.15 meter square per second square when we substitute the values of C 2, U, K and beta 1. Now, efficiency is nothing but since other efficient other losses are not mentioned we can write it as rho V dot W B L by rho V dot G H which is 0.86 or 86 percent. And the rotational speed can be found out by the relationship that u equal to pi n d by 60, u already we have found out to from the relationship of the ratio of the bracket speed with the jet speed and hence we can find out n to be 1017 rpm. And the power out uh, we have found uh, we know is 1200 kilowatt. So, we can find out m dot by dividing by W B L. W B L already we have found out. So, we get m dot as 268.52 kg per second. And now, the problem says that there are two jets. If there are two jets, then this mass flow rate 268.52 or m dot will be divided into two jets two nozzles. So, each nozzle will handle a velocity C j and the diameter of the nozzle will be d j. We need to find out the diameter of the jet which is d j. So, we can write that m dot is equal to 2 times the mass flow rate through each of the jets, each of the nozzle. So, we can say rho times pi by 4 d j square multiplied by C j and hence we can get that d j we can write the d j is nothing but 2 m dot by rho pi c j and which is equal to 41 millimeter. And you can also check what is the ratio of capital D by d j which is called the ratio of the wheel diameter to the jet diameter and as we have discussed in the theory it should be between 11 and 14 but need not be in all the cases. So, ideal cases it should be between 11 and 14 for a well designed turbine, but the problem that we have taken here need not give you that uh, range. So, we have now talked about in this Pelton turbine problem how to assimilate the data 
construct the velocity triangles and then apply the different uh, coefficients for example, nozzle velocity coefficient what does it mean what it connects with that is the connection between the jet velocity with the head net head available we have connected with the uh, called the nozzle velocity uh, velocity coefficient we can talk about the ratio of the bucket speed to the jet speed we have found out the rotational speed using the relationship pi n d by 60. And since in this problem we had two jets we have found out the jet diameter by considering that there are two nozzles and identical nozzles. So, with this I come to a conclusion for the tutorials on the hydro turbo machines namely pumps, turbine and cavitation in hydro turbo machines. In the next week we will talk about the little bit of introduction of compressible flows, because we will talk about steam and gas turbines. And as we have already talked about in the introduction to turbo machines that we for steam and gas turbines there will be a large change in the density and the flow is going to be compressible. So, in the next week we will start with a discussion on compressible flow, a one dimensional compressible flow. and then from there we will take up steam and gas turbine. Thank you.